to Fruit and Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 128. For new viewers, Fruit and Knitting is a 90 minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra little snippets of travel, history, and storytelling to add joy to your life and bring a smile to your face. And we hope you've all had a wonderful holiday season with your family and friends and that you've also had some quality time with your knitting needles. Madeline and I have taken our knitting in some new directions over the last couple of weeks and we have some quite unusual and exciting knitting projects to show you today. But first, let me tell you about our featured guest for this episode. So during our recent trip to Prince Edward Island in Canada, we interviewed the celebrated textile artist Deanne Fitzpatrick, who lives in Nova Scotia. So Deanne is renowned for her absolutely stunning hooked rugs, some of which are in the permanent collections of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and the Canadian Museum of Civilization. So the craft of rug hooking goes back centuries. Originally, it was done as a chore of poverty, where people would cut up old clothes into strips and hook rugs to cover their cold floors. Rug hooking now has changed into a medium for fibre artists and Deanne Fitzpatrick has really developed the craft into an art form. And before preparing for this interview, I knew absolutely nothing about rug hooking, but I now consider it to be the perfect accompanying craft for us knitters. And that's because in comparison to knitting, the technique is really simple and it uses up all the leftover bits and pieces that knitters naturally have in their stash but have difficulty finding a use for. So I think you'll find that Deanne is a wonderful communicator and she gives us a really comprehensive overview of both her own work as an artist and on how to get started with rug hooking. So I think you'll love the interview. I think so too. Now we live in Germany and Germany is well known for its Christmas markets, which usually start around mid-November and go up to Christmas Eve. We wanted to show you what a German Christmas market is like. So today we're taking you to Esslingen in Southern Germany, which has a special Christmas market with a medieval theme. So on the market, you can watch crafts. People show off their skills the way they did in medieval times. And as you walk around the market, you'll come across performers in medieval costumes, musicians playing medieval instruments and traditional storytellers. So it has a wonderful festive atmosphere and we put together a little short film for you so that you can experience it as well. So that's a summary of our program and we'll start with mum in Bring and Brag. Yes, okay. So <laughs> meet Count Dracula. Isn't he gorgeous? He's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> this is another pattern by the UK toy designer Alan Dart who we interviewed back in episode 118. So last episode, I showed you the nest of birds here, which is a great teat feeding her chicks. And she's got a little piece of yarn in her beak to resemble a, a worm. Yeah. So this is my first time knitting toys. And I just love how realistic Alan Dart's patterns look and how quickly you can knit them up. So Count Dracula here is a Christmas present for a friend and they're getting their Christmas present late because I had to keep him and show him off to you. But I must admit that I have fallen a little bit in love with charming Dracula and I'm going to miss him when I give him away. <laughs> he just makes me laugh so much when I see him. So as I've said before, toy knitting isn't my favourite kind of knitting to do. But assembling all the pieces together and seeing the character come alive is really pleasurable and rewarding. And I have actually learned a lot through the process. The more I knit Alan Dart's patterns, the more I really appreciate how detailed and exact he is with his techniques and calculations. So the patterns are really immaculately written. It's also really interesting to see all the possible shapes that you can do with knitting on a very mm. small scale, just using simple techniques. So Alan is only ever using decreases, increases, short rows, and the knit and purl stitch. So I've used the recommended Sirdar yarn and everything is knitted in a DK weight yarn on three millimeter needles. And you're using a much smaller needle size than you normally would with a DK weight yarn so that you have a very tight gauge and the stuffing doesn't show through. And a tight gauge also means that the toy has more structure and can stand upright. So Count Dracula is knitted in pieces and then sewn together with mattress stitch and you stuff all the body parts as you go along. 
Count Dracula is very formally dressed in a white tie dress suit, which is the most formal of Western dress codes. He has a hand-tied white bow tie worn around a standing wing collar. His black cape has a blood red lining and under the cape he's wearing an evening tailcoat, high-waisted pants and a wine red waistcoat and black court shoes. But instead of the usual white gloves, Dracula has light grey gloves and he's carrying a stylish walking stick, which is also part of the white tie dress code. But he's not wearing a top hat, which is a good idea because it means you can see his widow's peak hairline. And villains and antagonists often have widow's peak hairlines, so it's good that Dracula has one too. Dracula's little bat companion is also really adorable. I have to smile every time I see them together. I think it's a really good composition how he's holding a work walking stick here and then he's holding up his little bat yeah. to show you there with a funny look on his face. So I was away when I was assembling Count Dracula, so I couldn't take any film of me doing it, but I did take some photos so I can show you the process of how he's put together. So you start with the black legs and white shirt body. That's knitted in one piece, then sewn together up the centre back and stuffed. Next his shoes are made and they're lined with cardboard soles to keep them stiff and to help him stand upright. The shoes are then stuffed and sewn to the trousers and his trouser cuffs are sewn on just to cover up the seams. The head and neck are knitted next and again they're knitted flat and seamed up the back of the head and then stuffed and sewn onto the body and afterwards the wing collar and bow tie are attached around his neck to cover the seam where the head was sewn on. The waistcoat is then added and the waistcoat is only a front so when you look at his back you can see where the sewing ends have been tied off and that's why it's so important to do each step in the correct order so the ends can be properly hidden. So for me, the most challenging parts were knitting his hands with all the little fingers and embroidering the facial expression or the facial features because it's amazing how much the facial expression will change just by placing the eyes, nose or mouth a couple of millimetres in a different position, either up or down or further apart. And in fact, if you don't get the pupils of the eyes, exactly level and looking outwards. He'll have a very crazed look expression on his face. Mm -hmm. And Alan does give very accurate instructions or clear instructions of exactly where to place the facial features. And he uses the, the rows and the stitches like a graph. So for example, for the, the pupils of the eyes, he'll say something like, place the French knot three rows down from the, the last decrease and five stitches in from the inner ear and that's really helpful to get an accurate result. So Alan also encourages you to firmly stuff the body parts so they don't flop around like a baby toy and he can stand up. Mm. And at first I overstuffed the head which made Dracula look more like Frankenstein. <laughs> or the scream from Edvard Munch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the painting. Yeah, it's true. He had a very long nose. Uh, not long nose, long, long uh, chin. Yeah, an over bloated head and a long chin. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Okay, and actually, Dracula is meant to look very handsome and charismatic with a veneer of aristocratic charm. So I couldn't leave him looking like the monster Frankenstein. And it was actually Madeline who convinced me to undo it all and take his head apart and take out some of the stuffing. And that actually worked wonders and changed mm. the whole look of his expression. It did, yeah. So that's good. He's very handsome now. He is, in a in a weird gothic way. <laughs> okay, so when you're embroidering the features, what you do is you split the three-ply yarn and you take out a single ply. So you're either working with one ply or two plies for the features. And that's how you get a thinner yarn in exactly the same colour. So all the embroidery stitches are pretty basic. The eyebrows are done with a chain stitch. The pupils of the eyes are French knots and the whites of the eyes are tiny chain stitches done in a circle with just one ply. And Dracula's fangs were the hardest for me to do because they're done with a bullion stitch. They needed to be solid enough so that you could see them from a distance against his cream face, but not too big that they looked out of proportion. So I had to practice that stitch quite a few times on a knitted swatch. And then at the end, you draw dark shading around his eyes with a grey crayon. And this makes a big difference to his appearance. 
So I found his face quite fiddly to do, but it was fun when I, I thought I got it right in the end, although he does look a little bit crazed still. <laughs> it's not exactly easy. Looks a bit angry. <laughs> Okay, and I should say something quickly about the walking stick. It's made out of a drinking straw. And here in Germany, you can't get or you can't buy plastic drinking straws. Mm. So it's a paper one. Yep. So if the recipient of Dracula is watching, don't get his walking stick wet because it might crumble up and, and just dissolve and he won't look so chic anymore. So the drinking straw is tightly bound with yarn and then there's a, a knitted uh cane topper on top and he's holding it by his third and fourth fingers are curled around and then sewn with a couple of stitches to the palm of his hand so that's how he's keeping that in position and then so that he can keep his right arm bent like this and hold up his little bat you sew a dart in the, on the inside of the elbow there yeah I think that's really clever it is it is. And then when you've finished everything, you spray the parts that you want to shape with hairspray and you pat the hairspray into the knitting and shape, say, the fingers or the facial features. Make sure his nose is very straight and his ears are sticking out. And then you just leave it to dry and set. So there you go. There's Count Dracula looking very debonair. He's gorgeous. I have to give him a kiss <laughs> before I give him away. Don't put lipstick on him. He's just know. put lipstick on his <laughs> He's got a little bit of lipstick on his collar. Well, he's a player. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to under construction with Madeline. Yeah. So when mum was looking through patterns for potential Christmas presents in Alan's um, online shop, we came across his knitted chess set. And I immediately got excited when I saw that and knew I had to knit it. The chess set is quite large and there's a lot of detail in each chess piece, so I can imagine it will look very classy and be a real showpiece when it's finished. I'm not brilliant at chess, but I enjoy playing it with friends and I have a small set to take to cafes, but this will be my large, elegant version to use at home. I think we should buy a special little table for it so we can constantly have it on display in the house. I think it'll look really cool. I think it will too, yeah. And we could put um, some form of glass cabinet over it I think because you don't want to get it dusty I know yeah that's yeah. a good idea okay anyway it's a super cool project and I've been really enjoying it I'm using the recommended Serdai yarn in chunky for the board and in DK for the individual playing pieces now the board itself measures 57 square centimeters and it has to be this big so that the playing pieces fit onto it properly um, because I'm putting so much effort into this chess set, I don't want the board to break if it's accidentally dropped. I want it to be sturdy. So I went to the hardware store and I had them cut a fairly thick piece of wood for me, as you can see. Yes. Yeah. And the chessboard's checker pattern is made up of eight individual strips. Could you hold that for me? Yeah. Thank you. So each strip was like one length of the chessboard. And then you sew them together using mattress stitch to create an invisible seam. And finally, you glue your knitted checker pattern onto your piece of wood so that it stays in place. If we just quickly show you the back. Mm. Oh, it's a lot those, of work. Yeah. All of those ends we have to sew in. I'm yep. going to help her. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I this, think I'll ever this get it done otherwise. This is the edging, which is interesting. It's in a wine mm. red. and Mum picked the colour. I really like it. You knit it double like this it wraps around and in the end all the edges will look a little bit like that which looks really neat yes yeah anyway as you probably know in chess each side has eight pawns two rooks two knights two bishops a king and a queen so i'm knitting 32 pieces in total and i think by the end of this project hopefully i'll be a toy knitting expert <laughs> for sure yeah each playing piece has a metal nut inside it. Yes, um, this is what they look like. Yeah, they're quite big and heavy, um, and they're supposed to weigh it down so it doesn't fall over. Um, and I think they're great because when you hold the pieces in your hand, they feel solid. They do, yeah. yeah. So all the pieces are also dressed in a medieval style. So the gowns and accessories of the black pieces all use various shades of grey, and the white pieces use different shades of white. But I'm going to give each playing piece slightly different colours. So I'm adding pastels to the white, color, white pieces and I'm going to add dark, rich colours to the black pieces. Dark, smouldering colours. Yes, because I think that just brings them alive even more. 
And it makes knitting them interesting because each That's individual true, yeah. character you can put different clothes on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a bit like playing dress up and dolls. Um, yeah, so I've already knitted two pawns and a rook, so I can tell you more about these playing pieces. Now the pawns are wearing simple gowns with a piece of yarn tied around their waist as a belt. And then they have these little bonnets as well. And I saw some people make versions in which um, the pawns had hair beneath their bonnets. And I thought that looked pretty cool. It made them look a bit more human. So I gave that a try as well. So they've got little curly fringes and plaits. Yeah. This one looks a bit pregnant. <laughs> it was a bit overstuffed. In German, they're not called pawns, they're called... Bauern. Bauern. So farmers. Farmers. Okay, yep. so she's a little far a pregnant farmer woman. Yeah. Okay, so that's the pawns. Now the head and body are knitted top down in one piece, and you start with a flesh tone to make the head, and then decrease several stitches in one row to shape the neck. And then you switch to the white yarn for the gown and do lots of increases in a single row for the shoulder shaping. Once you've completed the body, you make the arms and then the hood separately, and later you sew them onto the body. The arms were a little bit fiddly, but I managed all right, and after I added the stuffing and sewed the seams, I had to embroider the nose, eyes, and mouth. And this was my first time embroidering. And then at the end, I glued on the hair, the little fringe, and the plaits before I sewed on the bonnets. Now, the rooks are the tallest chess pieces at 13.5 centimetres. You start by knitting the tower in one piece, and Alan's so clever because he mimics the look of a real castle tower, which is built from individual stones. So you use pearl stitches to create the individual stones, and there are single knit stitches every so often, which represent the mortar that holds the stones together. And once you've completed the tower, you knit the battlement. A battlement is the platform on top of a castle tower, and it has these gaps called crenels through which arrows or cannonballs can be fired at the enemy. And finally, you create the flag, which is attached to a cotton bud as the flagpole. So you cover the cotton bud with glue and then wrap yarn around it, a bit like you do with a cane from Count Dracula. And then you glue the flag, which in my case is purple, um, to the cotton bud and cover it with hairspray and while the flag is still wet you can make it look a little bit like it's fluttering in the wind by shaping yeah. it. You so I it actually uh, folded it and put a pin in it yeah. until it dried. That was a really good idea. Yeah, That's some intense fluttering going on. <laughs> anyway, so I still have quite a few pieces to go and I think it'll take me a little while to finish my chess set, but I can't wait to be done Maybe and play with it. Maybe you can let me knit a couple of characters. I think I will. Because <laughs> they're, they're so much fun. They are fun. And it is surprising how heavy and stable they feel, yeah. actually, yeah. which is really good. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time to drive down to the city of Esslingen, which is near Stuttgart in southern Germany to visit a Christmas market with a medieval theme. So we hope you really enjoy it and we'll see you on the other side. We live in Germany and Germany is well known for its annual Christmas markets. The first Christmas market was held back in 1343, nearly 600 years ago in the city of Dresden. Christmas markets usually start around mid-November when it gets dark early and they really brighten up the winter months and make them more festive. I love Christmas markets. They have lots of colourful huts where you can get typical Christmas foods like gingerbread, roasted nuts, potato cakes with apple sauce on them and of course mulled wine to keep you warm. And you can also buy traditional German Christmas gifts. Typically people like to come here after work or with their families on the weekends. So we really wanted to show you what a German Christmas market is like and we've driven down to the city of Esslingen in southern Germany. Oh, oh, oh. 
I just bought some Lebkuchen, which is gingerbread, and Lebkuchen is a very typical thing you can get here at the Christmas market. It roughly dates back to the 13th century when the monks used to eat it together with um, a very strong glass of beer during their season of Lent. Basically, the dough contains a mixture of spices like nutmeg and cinnamon and ginger, and it's sweetened with honey. And it lasts for a very long time. It's super delicious. And if you store it with apples, it'll stay juicy even longer. Sicher im Streben, will ich zähl ich jeden Trinken in das Bad, Rad, früh und spart, hört man dringend singen, klingen, Bobbing in den Augen, durch helle, dünne, schöne, in den Strauen rauen, Essen, Klästen, Frieren, Frieren, wie der Streit, Streit, Angerweit, soll man grünlich, König, sehnlich, köstlich anschauen, die Kinder kalt, ungestalt, dein Gewalt ist ein Spalt von den süßen Lüftern, der stört Sommer, alle Kummer, will ich dummer als ein Flummer, Säuden um der Gehüft. Jagd den Schnee, ja, lag mit in den See, will der Meer des Blüten, nach die Galle, Groschen, Schalle, Lerken, Halle, uns gefallen, für des Ofens Gehirn. Groß und klein, Apfel klinge, lecke fein, gibt es hier beim Bäckelein. market here is very special because since the late 90s it has a medieval theme to it. The market is set up in the historic district which is full of beautiful old half-timbered houses called Fachwerkhäuser and they really add to the medieval whole feel of the place. On the market you can watch different craftspeople show off their skills the way they did in medieval times. So you've got blacksmiths, rope makers and pewterers who make things out of tin. And when you walk around the market you'll also come across different performers like stilt artists and jugglers and best of all fire eaters. There are also musicians playing medieval instruments and what I find particularly lovely are the traditional storytellers because they're especially fun for the kids. They get to listen to these old fairy tales by someone who's dressed up in full costume. Many visitors also like to dress up in full costume. So I'd say we should explore the market and see if we can talk to some of these performers. Hi, I'm Reinich Go from the band Oho and I play a hurdy-gurdy. This is an instrument that was mm, since thousand years roundabout, but um, not so perfect like this. Uh, this sounds very good um, because it's, 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 uh, made, it, it was made very perfect. Every piece must be perfect. And um, it's a little bit like a violin because you um, because this is the bow from the violin. It's a, it's a, a wooden bow <laughs> and a little bit like a piano. Here we play this. 
and a little bit like a bagpipe because you have this uh, Bordun sound and you can also play a rhythm with this string and it sounds like this. I'm Scrimshaw Artist. I'm working here on Buffalo Horn or on Mammoth Task or on Bones. It's a very old technique since mankind exists. It's an engraving technique. Scrimshaw is a name for that. And all tribes around the world are engraving on this material, on ivory and bones, buffalo horns, tagua nut and so. And this time I'm doing it a tree, I'm doing it only by dot, dot by dot, or I'm doing lines when I'm doing fur or feathers. It's a very special technique and I only need one little needle here and a good magnifier or a microscope at home for my work. And really, really good hands. <laughs> Ich mache alles aus Lindenholz, das ist kurzfasrig, das kann man gut schneiden. Die Gräse spielt keine Rolle, nach, normalerweise nach jeder Fotografie. Wenn es irgendwie möglich ist, wird es gemacht. Und das mache ich schon 40, nur mehr wie 40 Jahre. Und die Hauptarbeit ist Weihnachtskrippen. Die Krippenfiguren, weil die mache ich noch von Hand, noch von Hand. Und es ist, gibt nichts Schöneres, wie wenn man sagen kann, ich habe mein Hobby zum Beruf gemacht. Es gibt nichts Schöneres. Und das hat Jahre gereicht. Nachfolger gibt es leider keinen. Aber das braucht man heute auch nicht mehr. Weil das macht heute alles die Maschine, macht heute niemand mehr von Hand. Wolfgang, es ist ganz simpel. Hast du Lust, jetzt mit meiner Eier zu spielen? Ich bin sehr gespannt auf die Antwort, mit der Hoffnung, dass die Antwort ist Nein. Richtige Antwort. Wolfgang, welcher von diesen drei Eier war deine? Guck mal, ich hilf dir. Du sagst ja, aber ich ja war. Nein, weil ich nicht war. Der Joker, das bin ich. Hilf. War es das hier? War es das hier? Oder war es das hier? Richtig! Du hast gewonnen!
Good year did you win a Quickstein prize? Du kriegst dein Eins oder? Drei! Eins! Zwei! Drei! Unglaublich! Und jetzt, ich riskiere mein Leben für euch! Naja, nicht ganz. Aber die Haare auf meine Beine, meine Damen und Herren. Ich riskiere die Haare auf meine Beine. Die Intelligenten unter euch haben es gemerkt, ich habe ein anderes Bein. Und jetzt, die haben auch Haare. Und jetzt fliegen die Fackel unter dieses Bein. Und jetzt unter beide Beine. Alle, eine hier, eine hier, eine da, eine hier, eine hier, eine da, eine da, eine hier, eine hier, eine da, eine hier, eine da, eine da. Und meine Damen und Herren, Thank you. 
Welcome back. We're still in under construction and I'm going to combine showing you my project and doing another pop psychology segment because they fit perfectly together. Now I'm sure many of you recognize this project. It's called Modest and it's from Kim Hargrave's Pale Collection. I started it around November last year but took a break when mum left for Australia and I got busy with my bachelor thesis and since then I've enjoyed some quick in it but the Taganig effect has finally caught up with me and so I've picked up my modest once more. I love this design and I love the yarn I'm using but it's not the recommended yarn for the pattern and unfortunately it's also not a good match for the design. I have told you about this before so I'll only give you the short version now. My yarn is the Devonia 4 ply by John Arben and it's quite a lot thinner than the recommended yarn and therefore I decided to knit my jumper at a tighter gauge by going down a needle size so that the cables wouldn't be too loose and flat so they'd pop nicely and I think this has worked out quite well um, but knitting at a tighter gauge also makes your jumper smaller which is why I'm adding extra width to the moss stitch on the sides. I started by knitting a swatch and then we calculated how many extra stitches I'd need to add to the sides uh, to compensate for my smaller gauge. Now this should have worked out fine as well but I ended up knitting even tighter than I did on my original swatch and it took me knitting the back piece and a quarter of the front piece until I seriously questioned whether this jumper would actually fit me and I blamed two thinking errors or fallacies for the fact that it took me so long to take this concern seriously. Okay, what are they? Well the main culprit is the sunk cost fallacy and it has a trusty sidekick called confirmation bias. Now the sunk cost fallacy describes how you really don't want to give up on something when you've already invested a lot of resources into it, even if it looks like it's going to fail. Uh, it's slightly light-hearted, but typical example of this is when you're halfway through watching a movie at the cinema that has turned out to be really boring, but you keep watching it until the end. Um, and the decision to keep watching the movie until the end is driven by emotion, not logic. You could decide to just get up and walk out and do something more pleasurable or more useful with your time. But because you've paid for the ticket and you're already halfway through the movie, you decide to keep watching it until the end. I think I'm pretty good at walking out on movies I don't like. <laughs> you probably are, yeah. <laughs> Um, but the reason we make these irrational decisions is that we struggle to let go of past costs when what we should do is focus only on the present and future costs and benefits of our actions. So you're not getting your ticket money back whether you finish the movie or not. You won't derive any pleasure from finishing the movie but you will lose an additional hour of your precious time. So in my case, I'd already knitted the back piece or finished yeah. most of the back piece and was up to the cabling on the front piece. And that had taken me quite a lot of time and effort. So when people started commenting that my project looked more like a hat than a jumper. <laughs> and actually it does. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's the size of a hat. <laughs> anyway, this immediately activated the sunk cost fallacy in me and I came up with a list of justifications for why my jumper was perfectly fine as it was and that is where the confirmation bias comes in. So the sunk cost fallacy goes hand in hand with the confirmation bias. Our mind tries to justify our irrational decisions by systematically ignoring or reinterpreting any evidence that contradicts our beliefs and we become great at finding tons of evidence that our project will be a success. So when people say my jumper looks like a hat, I say that it's meant to have a little bit of negative ease. <laughs> and anyway, it's only that tight around the waist. Then I show them how stretchy my jumper is and I explain that since I'm adding extra width to the moss stitch, it'll be just fine. It's true, it's very stretchy. It is, isn't it? Yes. If they point out that it will still look like it's plastered to my body, I respond that it'll loosen up once it's been heavily blocked. Okay, so how are you meant to avoid the sunk cost fallacy? Oh, well, um, as with all fallacies, the first step is just to be aware of its existence and then recognize that your actions and decisions are fear driven. So then you can distance yourself from those fearful emotions and focus instead on specific actions that you can take. Okay, so, so for instance, you're saying like people are frightened that if they admit it's not going to fit, then you've got, you know, you've got hours and hours and hours of, of re knitting. Re -knitting. 
That's or right. that you've invested way more than you're actually going to get return. That's what you're frightened of. That perfect. Yes. I'm anyway, ready. so once I admitted to myself that um, I might have fallen victim to these thinking errors, um, I decided to think about what I could lose and what I could gain if I continue to knit in the hope that the jumper does fit me. Well, if it does fit me, then I'll have saved myself from spending many more weeks re-knitting the entire jumper in a larger size. But if it ends up not fitting me, is there anything I can do to fix it? Now, I was thinking I can just graft in an extra panel of moss stitch on the sides and then that's fine, but mum, um, I burst your bubble. That, I destroyed that illusion. Yeah. Because you, if you've already shaped the arms, so if you're going to stick in an extra panel here, it mm. would just make the whole shaping of the underarm really bad. Well, so I that, think that's that a real work. shame, but then I crawled back to mum and I said, okay, can we go over the measurements again? And we actually came up with a compromise. So when we stretched the fabric and held it up to my torso, we saw that it, it did sort of look like it would fit me widthwise, even if it was a bit tight. If it's heavily, heavily blocked. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mum agrees that it'll feel a bit looser once it's been blocked. Um, but the tighter gauge has also shrunk my piece lengthwise, and we saw that the jumper would be too short for me, for sure. So my compromise is I've unraveled until right beneath the arms and I'm adding an extra five centimeters in length before I start the armhole decreases. Yeah. So then the jumper won't pull up and it won't pinch me underneath the arms. Yeah, because you've got this certain finite amount of material and if mm. you're going to stretch it madly in this direction, it's going to lose some length. Yeah. And so you definitely have to add some extra length. So yeah, so she unpicked it to below the, the shaping where the decreasing happens and then she's going to add some extra That's what I just said. length there. Yeah, just in case <laughs> nobody followed that. <laughs> anyway. And then start the decreases and it should work. Yeah. Um, but as you can see, I haven't completely cut my losses and re-knitted the whole jumper, but I've only backstepped a little. So I'm going to let you decide whether I've successfully avoided the sunk cost fallacy or whether I'm still being led astray by the confirmation bias. I think luckily for you, mm. no one's going to know until you finally finish this. And that's going to be for quite a few months. And by that oh. time, everyone will have forgotten about the confirmation bias. We'll see. We'll <laughs> or just have to wait not. and see. It's a typical dilemma for knitters, yep. actually. I think we can all, we should hashtag sunk cost fallacy knitting. <laughs> So coming up next is our interview on the craft of rug hooking with Deanne Fitzpatrick. Madeline and I really enjoyed the time that we spent with Deanne, didn't we? Yeah. She's yes. very generous and creative and we felt quite a strong connection to her. And because we had to travel to Nova Scotia to her studio to interview her, we ended up spending a couple of evenings with her. So the first evening we went out to the local pub for dinner, which was great. And the second evening, she invited us around to her home for dinner and we met her husband and we got to see her beautiful old maritime farmhouse. It's actually always a little bit sad when you meet new friends and you feel a really strong connection to them, but then you have to travel thousands of kilometres home again mm. and you never know when you're going to see them again in person. It's always a little bit sad. Anyway, apart from being a celebrated fibre artist, Deanne is also a writer and she's published several books on rug making and creativity. And her books are so much more than just how-to guides. They're beautiful and poetic and they include a lot of storytelling. And I've got a few of them here that I want to show you. So Hook Me A Story is perhaps my favourite. It has everything you need to know about rug hooking in a little friendly book. It starts out with an historical perspective of the early settlers covering their cold floors and the development of rug making as a cottage industry in Atlantic Canada. And then it goes into some practical things like what materials you need to use and the types of designs that you can do and also how to get started with rug hooking, etc. These other two books are also beautiful, but they're more like coffee table books with beautiful illustrations. And they're all about Deanne's development as an artist over her 25 year career, both designing and teaching.
And then there's this little book called Meditations for Makers. And in this book, Deanne shares thoughtful insights about her creative life as an artist and an entrepreneur in the form of small poems or vignettes. And actually in the introduction to the interview, you can hear her reading out aloud one of these poems. So Deanne is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount of all her products in her online store. And that includes all her books on rug hooking and her kits, and there's over 60 to choose from. And she also has a huge variety of hand-dyed yarn and supplies. And Deanne is also offering Fruity Knitting patrons a free link to her online course, which is called Hooking Freestyle, Making Rugs with Creative Freedom. And that's normally valued at around $70. So that's a, a fantastic offer. Thank you so much to Deanne. So I hope some of you will try rug hooking along with Madeline and I. As I said previously, I do think it is the perfect accompanying craft for us knitters because you can use up all those precious scraps of yarn or even single skeins that mm. you don't know what to do with because I've got a few of those. Yep. Okay, so I'd like to remind you that producing fruity knitting is only possible through the financial support of patrons. And it is very inexpensive to become a patron. You can do so for just the cost of one coffee per month. And every single patron makes a big difference to us. So please do support our work by becoming a patron. And thank you to all the wonderful viewers who have done that. Yeah, so it's time for us to say goodbye now. Enjoy the interview and we'll see you again in a few weeks. Bye. Bye. There is ease in being together. Joy found in the pure moments of walking down a rural road where leftover farms have found new homes in the bramble. There is good love found in wanting your friends to float on small waves of success, knowing that when we come through our front doors, it is only what happens there that matters at all. Knowing that someone sees your heart and believes in your goodness is reason enough to be alive. No need to search too hard when you have friends that remember you. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Today's interview is all about one of the oldest home crafts and that's rug hooking. Rug hooking was once considered a chore of poverty, but now it's used as a medium for artists. So I am thrilled to have the celebrated textile artist, Deanne Fitzpatrick, join me today. Deanne is renowned for her stunning hooked rugs, some of which are in the permanent collections of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and the Canadian Museum of Civilization. So thank you so much for inviting us to your studio. I'm here. excited you're here. Yeah, yeah. and we better tell the, the viewers that we're in Amherst, Nova Scotia. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, we are. We're here in Amherst. So the history of rug hooking is actually mm. really fascinating. It, it had is. its heyday in Canada around 1850. So can you tell us how rug hooking developed in the Newfoundland and Labrador region? So rug hooking developed in Newfoundland and Labrador, we think, or somewhere along the Atlantic coast. We don't really know. But basically what happened is people wanted to warm their cold floors with with. Uh, these warm, beautiful rugs. And what they would do is they would take old burlap bags because jute was developed in the 1850s from India. So then food would come in the burlap bag, like potatoes and oats and things. And they would take their uh, old clothes and they would cut them into strips because there wasn't much of anything, right? Mm. They would cut them into strips and then they would hook them onto the burlap bag. And it's thought that that kind of rug hooking sort of developed in Atlantic Canada. Now we know it was derived from proddy hooking in England or from um, other rug making throughout the world, but it is thought to be one of the kind, one of the crafts that is, is developed up in here. North America. Yeah. So um, my grandmother would have, I never knew my grandmother, but the story goes that they would take a piece of charred wood out of the fire and draw it onto um, 
a pe onto the burlap bag and they would often draw medallions like these rugs here um, you know like this rug is a medallion and scrolls and they would often sometimes draw like uh, uh, their boat or their house my mother always would do hit and miss and this is a very kind of traditional style of Newfoundland pattern mm -hmm. and the traditional rose is another uh, another one so this is this one and then the other one were kind of all over florals. Now, these are rugs that I have drawn and designed, but they are based on traditional designs mm -hmm. that came from Atlantic Canada. There was a, um, a company called Garrett's in New Glasgow, and Garrett's would make uh, stamp patterns because... After the women, you know, when they would they would go into service and they would come back and they would draw patterns that were similar to the um, to the to the patterns they saw in merchants' in homes in these big yeah. houses or in, in sea captains' homes. But then after that, what happened was there were companies like Garrett that began and they started stamp pattern businesses. So people would go door to door and sell the stamp patterns, or they would sell them in catalogs. And Garrett's was a big business; it had a, a mailing list of 20,000 people and they sold patterns all over North America. There were other pattern makers in the States as well. From there, um, or around the same time, actually, there were cottage industries industries that grew up um, in different locations. One of the cottage industries was Grenfell Industries. Mm -hmm. And he was a doctor from the States. And what he would do is he um, would hire designers to come and they would design the rugs and then they would farm out all of that to um, different houses and the women would make the rugs and they would um, deliver them to, um, and they, they would deliver them back to Grenfell. He would go to the States and sell them. They were famous for the slogan, when your stockings run, let them run to Labrador because they would have silk stockings and hook straight across. Okay, now, so that was quite a strong cottage industry. It was strong, yes, and there were several different ones. Yeah, yeah. and a couple of, and if I remember correctly, a couple of the very typical Grenfell uh, pictures would be beautiful sailing ships. Is that right? Yes, sailing ships, uh, people on uh, on ice floes, things like that. And by the 1950s, there was a woman called Elizabeth Lafort, and Elizabeth would um, she was one of the first people who sort of made art out of rugs and she would do enormous portraits and they were really beautiful and she was in Shetta Camp. Yeah. 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 She's done ones of very famous people and, and I think the Queen. Yes. The, the Queen. I think one of her rugs was given to the Queen when the Queen visited. Yeah. Yeah. Queen yeah. Elizabeth. Okay. So that's a very brief history of the history of rug making. But, but um, we've got to talk about these. These we are do. your antique yeah. collection. These are my antique collection of hooks. So one of the things I love about rug hooking is that it was all about using what you had. So people would like take an old knife and then uh, oftentimes the husband of the house, both men and women hooked, but it was mainly women. And often the husband of the house, he would file down uh, the, the bit of the knife or take a nail and put it into a piece of wood and then file down and make the hook. And that's what was used to hook the rug. So I love this one with the uh, initials on it, you know, yeah. right there. And she so wanted she, to keep she it. She did not want to lose that. And then some people would hook like this. So every hook was different and it was made for a hand. And I just find that so beautiful. Yeah. It is fascinating how they've used, like that is obviously a door handle. I'd a say, doorknob, yeah, a doorknob. And that one's a knife, like you said. Piece of pipe. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful. They're little artifacts in themselves, I think. Very beautiful. Yeah, and I think really you're lovely. going to donate them to a museum, is that right? Yeah, I'd like to donate them to the, we're in the process of donating them to a museum. I have a nice big collection and I think they, they need to be cared for and loved mm. into another generation. Definitely. Safely, yeah. Okay, now contrary to what, people might imagine you didn't actually learn to hook at your mother's knee no, did you I did not so tell no. us a, a little bit about your early development so rug hooking kind of died out in the 50s and it wasn't a popular craft at, at the time when I learned now when I was about 16 years old my sister had old old rugs on her farmhouse floor and I liked them and I was interested in them but I was not interested in craft at that time I didn't want to learn when I was 24 we bought an old farmhouse and that changed things I wanted mats for that floor and when I would go to auctions they were dirty and you know rustic and worn out and they were $200 so I wanted to make uh I wanted to start making rugs for the floor so my sister and 
three of my sisters and I went to a workshop with the Rug Hooking Guild of Nova Scotia that was held in Tatamagush, and a woman named Marion Kennedy uh, put together this kit for me, and this was my very first rug. <laughs> so I was, and it's a, this is a traditional Garrett pattern. It's called a blue nose pattern. And you, we, it was hooked with wool cloth. So the background here was an old coat and an old skirt. And, uh, like my mother, when I started this again, she was, she couldn't believe it, that we were even bothering with it. My mother didn't hook from the time she was six until the time she was 70. And she saw it as a chore of poverty, really. Yeah. And that's what it was associated with. But as soon as I began hooking, I knew it was for me. I felt it in my bones. I just loved the rhythm. And Marion, when she taught me how to hook, I said, you know, should I take these out? And she said, no, just finish it. It was just about <laughs> getting her done, you know? And so I love, I, I st- love that I still have this rug. That's very, yeah. very special, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so what is continuing to motivate you to hook now? Like what themes particularly inspire you? Mm-hmm. So I... Um, this rug is very different from what I hook now. I've moved away from cloth because cloth is not readily available, as easily available anymore. And I like to hook with a lot of different textures and a lot of different colors. For me, I sort of hook in a painterly style. Mm -hmm. I just sort of feel like I'm making a painting, but it's with wool, really. And now I like to see my rugs on the floor too. I'm still good with that. But <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> thinking we've got a beautiful painting right behind us. Yeah, yeah, I don't I don't think that's where most of them are going. And so I like to I have about six or eight different themes that I like to work on. And what I'd really like to do is take you through the studio and show you the different rugs Absolutely. and talk about the different themes. It would be so much fun. We would love yeah. that, wouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun. I hope so. So this rug is sort of a riff of the traditional pattern of an all over floral pattern that we talked about earlier. Um, What I've done is I've tried to make it a bit more modern. You'll notice that it has a heavy dark outline and all the outlines are not the same. I kept using different different wools, which is sort of a non-traditional thing to do. I've added in the leaves. Then I have them kind of almost swimming on this bed of pink. And I love the contrast of the pink and the red together. Not a very traditional color composition at all when it comes to hooked mats. So that's what I'm doing here. So Nova Scotia is famous for blueberry fields and I often work them into my rugs. I love using the reds and they turn a beautiful red in November. In this rug, I was really trying to get some feeling in the sky. Like, so I've just taken a big area and I've sort of painted the sky in here with a lot of different wools. There's probably 20 different wools in here, maybe more. I've got a little sparkle in there. And I just want you to, to feel the mood of that storm pending over those blueberry fields. This rug is very much like the collection that I have at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, the very mention of home, and it is about being in the middle. When I was 16, I left Newfoundland, I lost my sense of belonging, and I think I'm still working that out as an artist. It's also about middle age and sometimes how, you know, as a woman in middle age, I felt like I'm teetering on the edge. So I think that house is me. It's kind of a self-portrait. So I like to work small also. Sometimes I'll work small individually, but a lot of times I like to create a series of tiny landscapes. So I'll work, like these take about an hour, an hour and a half to make, and I'll make them and make them as a part of a whole. So for example, I might hang 36 of these together and I'll have a whole series of tiny landscapes and they look really dramatic and really beautiful together. So 
So this piece goes back to the houses I grew up with in Newfoundland and the flat tops and really loving that architecture. It also, uh, the doves started appearing in my, in my rugs um, about, about last year. And I would say that really this rug is about peace and the importance of peace, peace in the village, but also the necessity of making peace in your house and making peace with your own people before you start working on peace in the village, that it starts with us. This rug began with the drawing of the magnolia branches in winter. You can just see the buds and I just love the structure of them. And as I was drawing them out, the phrase, and the hatches are battened with the limited knowledge of the heart came to me. And I knew I had to write that in the rug because I, I just love the beauty of the phrase, of the sentence. And really, as I hooked the rug, I came to understand what the meaning of that sentence was because I wasn't sure at first. And it really just means that sometimes it's our lack of understanding or our limited knowledge that makes us closed off to things. And so that is this rock. So this rug beyond the peonies, I'm, you know, I'll usually just sketch on maybe very roughly some lines, maybe some of the peonies and I'm, working more intuitively than I am um, planning it all out. One color is telling me what the next color should be. And I, I sometimes don't even know what it's going to look like in the end. I'm not really thinking like a very structured picture. I'm just kind of following my intuition from one texture to the next texture and from one color to the next color. And I'm kind of lost. I'm kind of lost in it. And these rugs developed from walking and looking into the woods and seeing so much uh, undergrowth and interesting shapes and textures. That was so inspiring, having a look around your studio. I certainly want to have a go at it. <laughs> Good. And um, so for the viewers who would like to have a go at hooking, how should they get started? So what are the basic materials? And maybe you could even show us the technique. Sure, I'd love to. One of the things I love about rug hooking is that it is such a simple craft. You don't need very much. You can start off really inexpensively or you can get it as elaborate as you want but as long as you have your piece of linen or hessian or burlap mm -hmm. whatever whatever you want yeah and you just take that and attach it to a frame of some sort you need a hook you need some scissors and then for the knitters it's great because you can use up all your old stash like all those little tiny balls that you exactly. have exactly yeah <laughs> and you can use old cloth like this is old wool jersey i like wool i go for wool and silk that's important to me but and I, you know what I'd really like to do is I'd like to take you around the corner and show you on my, on my frame so that okay. I can show you the whole process. We'll go there. Good. All right. Let's do that. <laughs> so it's really a simple thing. You do need to stretch your linen or your burlap on something. So I'm using a hoop here, but you could use a wooden picture frame and thumbtack your pattern on it. I really want to make sure that you know that it's accessible. So. I'm using yarn and I'm going to show you the very basic technique and you could use a long length of yarn or a short length of yarn. It doesn't matter. So you're going to hold your hook at a 45 degree an angle. I've got my, I'm threading it through my fingers just like you would if you were knitting or crocheting and I have that underneath my frame. I'm going to put my hook down and I'm going to catch my wool. I'm going to bring my end up and then I'm going to go loop by loop and I hook in every second or every third hole because I want there to be space. If I hook too tight, my rug's gonna curl and it's not gonna lay flat. So you're just gonna keep on going just like that and then I bring my end to the surface and then I clip off my ends even with the rest of the loops. Now, it takes a little while to get your tension so let's start again. I'm gonna bring my hook down, catch my end, bring my end up every second or every third hole. You want to make sure your surface is covered. That's what you're trying to do. Just like that. 45 degree angle. Bring my end up, 
clip it off even. It's the opening and the closing of the linen or the burlap that sort of keeps it into place. There's no knotting, there's no tying. Just like that. So right now I want to just show you um, a little bit more if you wanted to get um, a little bit more interesting or a little bit more advanced. I sometimes like to cut wool cloth and you just take a piece of wool cloth and I find about 12 inches long is good. Then I fold it and then I cut it into strips. So one of the things I like to do, say in the background here, is I like to blend different textures. And when I'm hooking, I'm hooking every second or every third hole. And I'm trying to make it so that, if, like if you've hooked a little bit, you want to be able to blend your fabrics. So I'm making it so that I'm going in with one texture into another. And then that allows my rug to be really interesting. So we'll take this yarn now and we'll continue it and bring it right up to the cloth. And you can mix cloth and yarn in the same rug easily. And the blending, what like if I was, because we're painting with wool, we don't get to layer colors on top of each other like in a regular painting. We're laying colors side by side. And so we want the colors to sort of blend together like kind of seamlessly, really. And that's how you get a really interesting background or field or whatever it is you're doing. And remember, you're just gonna clip your ends off even with your wool. And then I could even bring in another wool. And sometimes I'll take two strips of yarn together and you can still be thinking about the blending. And so I'm hooking two strips at once. Whoops, there we go. Now it's really easy to pull out too. So if I made a mistake, for example, if I decided I didn't like that cloth and I wanted to pull it out, or if I decided I didn't like this and I wanted to pull it out, you just take it from the top or the bottom and just pull it out just like that. So you have to be careful with your cats because they love to pull it out. Yeah, and so this is a nice variegated yarn and we're gonna bring that in and we're gonna blend it. And it's as simple as that. So you've just seen how simple the hooking technique and I think that some of our viewers would actually like to start immediately with their own design. I hope so. so as an artist, can you just talk a little bit about the basics of design? Sure. It's designing for hook rugs is simple, first of all. And even if you can't draw, you can still like something like this. Just a simple, you know, routine little drawing of geometric of trees. It yeah, could be Christmas could trees. be Christmas trees, could be circles, could be squares. You can make a great rug and like for this I'd probably outline it in all in in uh, dark green and then fill it in in mid greens and then have a background of goals and rust four colors okay. you got a rug and of course you know you can you can get a little bit more complicated I'll take that one you take that yep. one thank you one of the things I like to do is I like to I you know I think in designing it's really good to think about the rule of thirds mm -hmm. so I love the graphic nature of this I love how it's telling a story but also if you look you know you got you got the rule of thirds going across you got it coming down you're filling up you're looking after filling up your whole space really mm. you want to make sure that that you have something going on and this one is a little bit different it doesn't have one focal point it's kind of has you know it's brought all together but you do have that rule of thirds which is great now if you were looking at color for this one automatically I go to primary you know you got your royal blue for the sea you got uh three green boats you got three red houses you know it's simple that's so really you, great you can get really you can get really complicated or if or you can keep it quite easy okay so typically yeah. you would just get a dark color yes. and outline you, that's the first thing you do? That's a good point because one of the most important things in rug hooking is outlining. So you would outline these houses perhaps in white or black and fill mm -hmm. them in in red. And in a in a piece like this, you would do a lot of outlining. Okay. Yeah. Now, I know a lot of people will know the rule of thirds, but just for the, those people who yeah. may not, 
what is it? It's basically dividing your your page. Yeah, it's in- dividing your canvas mm-hmm. in into thirds, so you can do it vertically mm-hmm. and you could do it horizontally yeah. and just making sure that you have the the rule of thirds allows you to create balance mm-hmm. right throughout your um throughout your piece so if you if you consider having something in every area mm-hmm. then you know that your canvas is yes. is covered and and that it'll be pleasing to look at that's what you want to make sure of yeah. so it okay. is a good rule for for any kind of art yeah yeah um now this one is the shepherdess so i've just drawn this in my sketchbook and um, I'm what I like about this one is that, well, again, I, with a lot of my rugs, there's a story here. There's the woman and her sheep, right? So there's the shepherdess. And you're kind of led in. And I noticed you pointed out earlier, she kind of leads you in and up to the sky. Mm. So there's a lot of perspective in this one because mm. she's in the foreground. So she's the focal point. Mm. She's the most important thing. The story's all about her. And then there's one lonely sheep back here that she's you know this is her sheep they have a they have a relationship right they love each other and then there's her community in the background and then you have these these soft hills and of course you have these circles or moons and for me i like to decorate spaces right so this empty space i i don't want it to just be an ordinary sky i want this to have a kind of a sense of whimsy about it right and what i also like it is if you look at it not as a picture but again geometrical shapes yes you've got circles there you've got rolling lines here you've got very straight lines here uh, yeah. Yeah. Again, you have circles, you have triangles, you yeah. have squares, yeah. you know, you have ovals. Again, it's all about designing hook rugs is all about taking shapes mm. really and turning them into ideas. And naive thoughts. art really fits with this, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. 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 It is a naive okay. art. Okay. And you've started, she's just started to draw. Yeah. So I've just redrawn this here. Mm-hmm. Now this is where it gets interesting because well, first of all, you can see that I've made some mistakes, which is great. So I can show you, you know, that I'm, I'm trying to create balance. So all you have to do if you make a little mistake is you redraw. I want to finish this off here because I want to put some of those circles in there. My little. And if you do a real big mistake, you can turn it over and draw another picture on the back. Absolutely. You can begin again. There's nothing, there's nothing to be afraid of. That's yeah. what I like to tell people when they're designing hook rugs. There's nothing to be scared of. So I want to bring in some interesting textures in here. So I'm probably going to start with, you know, taking this color and probably doing her face in that mm-hmm. color. You know, mm-hmm. um, I can sort of see, see how this green is dyed. And it's got a great model. Now, I, like, I'm envious of all your stashes out there because <laughs> I know that you have like all these little balls that you can just bring out yes. and, and use all these little bits. Yeah. You like, there's, yeah, there must got, be an end to every color in that square. There is, there is, there is. <laughs> <laughs> that you could use in this. Like you could take that palette and bring it yeah. right here. Yeah. Um, so I'm probably going to take these medium greens and you can see this is dyed very subtly. Like there's, there's, just very subtle gated. variations yeah. there. Now, this is a hand spun that a local woman spins. So I'm probably going to take that and just mix a little of it in with this, right? Mm-hmm. So then I'm going to have this really textured so th- area yeah, in the background. That's going to be the green yeah. behind her head. For, yeah. her, for her here, this is, you know what? This is actually, this is a boucle sweater that was unwound. So someone okay. knit the sweater, wore it, unwound, and then hand dyed, Right. Gorgeous. After. Okay. So that's probably going to be her that's hair. Her and I want to, hair. and you don't have to, you know, I can use everything from sock yarn, but like you asked me earlier, mm-hmm. if I was using sock yarn, I'd use three or four strands at a time. Mm-hmm. But I use lots of worsted yarn. So I'm going to take this worsted and that's going to be her coat. I'm going to take some more worsted and put it up here. As in the, those okay, in the back dark, hills. Yeah. And I always want black. Black's very important. And I usually like a couple of different weights of black. So I'll have a two ply, a three ply, and a four ply. Because some outlines I want them to be very noticeable thick, yeah. and thick. And some I want to recede a little bit yeah. and make them thin. This is a silk yarn from one of my favorite dyers. And I love this. See how just feel that. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful, yeah. right? So that's going to be my sky. That's kind oh, of that's a magical a beautiful sky, quality. isn't Won't it? Won't that be a gorgeous sky? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with those circles, but I kind of feel like those circles are going to be moons. So oh. they might reflect 
And and that will bring, because yeah. you can use color to bring balance yeah. in a piece too, right? So what I don't want to happen is I don't want too much texture or too much of mm. any one yarn. Now, I love this. This is this is a gorgeous yarn. And I'll probably take that and I'll do some do some mixing of that in yes. my back heels up so there. So just a tiny little bit. Yeah. That's a tiny bit of texture. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Or you can even do some outlining sometimes. Would you You could, yeah. It? You could. Yeah. The good thing about rug hooking is with, with your variegations, when you have when you have a variegated yarn like that, it does kind of all the work for you in mm-hmm. a way when you're filling in a hill. Like it shades it for you. So that's really great. And I don't know, I took this one out too because I just look we know it belongs so I don't color plan everything out first I'll just sort of give myself an idea I could end up using 45 different yarns in this little piece Mm. or I could or you could do it with seven yarns it's up to you it's a very accessible craft right it is a very accessible craft for us knitters, for sure. It is. It's yeah. just perfect for us <laughs> with yeah. our stashes and yeah. leftovers. Well, look, it's been a totally fascinating interview, and I am so pleased that you've come on Fruity Knitting. So thank you. I'm honoured. I really am. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. See ya. Prayer. For the snow that adds light to the night, for the moon that shines down upon it, for me, the little one who wanders down below it, with more questions than answers, more joy than sorrow, more love than anger. May the moonlight lead me to find a way to share the abundance that has been laid bare before me. May I be good, be kind, be true. May I love the day before me and truly see it for the gift it is. Amen.